Alan from Space Audits. Alan. Dave, goodbye. <laughs> Yo, what's up, dog? I'm trying to drop Dave. <clears> really? Can't do it. Hold on. Hava Nagila, Hava Nagila. I like it. It's a good entrance song for him. Exit song in this good stuff. Case. All right, what's up, my friend? How are you? Doing good work yeah, how there, are you? by the way. I'm doing okay. Thank you. Uh, if I could figure out how to turn off this music, we could. There we go. The song's like 10 minutes long, <laughs> too. Uh, we can break out into it's a dance. Classic. If we want. It is a classic. <laughs> Billboard top top 50, I think, for several months in a row. Pretty impressive. Yeah, I don't think it's ever gone below one. It's always the best one. <laughs> it is always number one. Once it fell down yeah, to number two, but it was another. It was another Jewish song. I can't remember which one it was that uh, popped in number one, then fell right out. So it's pretty cool. All right, we've got the uh, Havan the Mueller remix. <laughs> Four minutes. I think it's the Diddy remix, if I remember right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they did. They did a collaboration. Yeah, for the Godzilla movie. Uh, I think. Yeah. Yep. So, so I'm going to be doing my segment on absolute space. All right. Um, and the concept of that and the measurements that are made with interferometry regarding absolute space. So one second here, switch scenes. Okay. That should switch me. I see it. Yes. And I'll try and get you a little larger. Cool. All right. So we're going to look here from Einstein's 1905 paper where he's talking about absolute space and the concept of the ether and what it means to abolish the ether or to remove it conceptually from physics. <clears throat> so what he says here is that we will raise this conjecture to a to the purport of a postulate, right? And it'll be called the principle of relativity and we will introduce another postulate irreconcilable from the former, it will in, namely that light will uh, propagate in empty space with a definite velocity of C, which is independent of the state of motion of the emitting body. And then he goes on to say that these two principles will suffice to, um, you know, fix the problems with Maxwell's electrodynamic theory and moving in state and moving in stationary bodies. And then on top of that, he says the introduction of a luminiferous ether will be per, will prove to be superfluous in so much here as the development of the theory will not be required an absolute stationary space provided with special properties, nor will we assign velocity vectors to a point in the empty space in which electromagnetic processes took place. And then we're going to read one more for how uh, where Einstein's equations apply. So here he's kind of giving an, a, a thought experiment analogy, and he's what he's describing is a uh, an atomic clock going around the Earth at the equator. And this is before atomic clocks, obviously, but this is his conceptualization of where his equations apply. So if a clock at A is moved with a velocity of, of, of nu along the line AB to B, and at its arrival at B, the two clocks are no longer in sync. But if clock A to uh, if, if, if clock if the clock has moved from A to B and lags behind the other, which has remained by B or uh, B by one half times two v, two v uh, two v squared over C squared, the magnitudes of the higher or the higher order the time being occupied by the journey from A to B. So what he's saying here is that it is apparent at once that the results still hold good if the clock moves from A to B in any polygonal line as and also when the points from A to B coincide. And if we assume that the results proved for the polygon line are also valid for the continuously curved line, right? So he's saying that if you have a uniformly rotating uh, motion, that the speed of light will be the same. Okay, so that leads us into uh, Sagnac in absolute space and all this, right? So what he did was to explain the Michelson-Morley experiment. He said, even though we're on elliptical orbit paths, um, that they're actually we're actually traveling along geodesics through space-time curvature, and that and that because it's a linear motion, you can't measure linear motion with interferometry or anything, because there's no uh, fixed point of absolute. There's no absolute reference frame to measure it with. So if we look here at what I'm showing, mm -hmm. we have a we have a line. That's supposed to represent, uh, one second, I can't, I can't move this. All right, here we go. This line's supposed to represent linear motion. So this has no fixed point of reference. And the one down here is uh, angular rotation, right? So this has a fixed point of reference in the center. So this, that's why they say like, oh, uh, rotation is absolute or whatever, because they have this point here. So any point, any tangential speed along the rim of this is with respect to this absolute reference frame. Right. So they'll... So when they plug in their equations here, what this equation is describing, this this delta t equals two vl over c lambda, or or four omega a over c lambda, it's describing the same thing. So in reality, right, when we measure this device, we'll get the area of it, and we know how fast we're going to rotate it, right? 
And when it's rotating in the lab, the area of that device, the length of it is still the same. And the uh, uh, how fast it's rotating is the same. It's not changing, right? So we have these two variables, yet we have, and we have a split light beam that's supposed to be propagating at the same speed, yet when the beam recombines, there's a gap in the, in the phase uh, proportional to the velocity of the rotating device. So what's happening is, is this measurement is being made with respect to absolute space. So conceptually, right, the distance is changing, right? But in, uh, it's only with respect to absolute space. And it's the same for linear motion too, but because they didn't get the velocity that they needed to confirm heliocentrism, they said that doesn't exist. But really in 2000, what was it? 2004, when Ru Yong Wang came along with a linear interferometer, he had an exact length, right? So he had an exact length. So let's say from this X to this X. And when he moved that exact length, that's what he measured. Like uh, it showed a fringe proportional to the velocity of that moving length. So what that shows is that there is an absolute, like absolute space doesn't just stop for rotational motion, right? It's, uh, this is what they've been hiding because this is direct evidence that the earth is stationary. So this is to kind of give some visualizations on what is absolute space? What does it mean to invoke it? Um, and what Einstein, what Einstein's thoughts on that were. So Einstein's was saying that he could explain a rotating interferometer without invoking this center uh, fixed point here. Right, so that's why when Sagnac came along with his, because uh, Einstein says that any closed polygonal loop in uniform motion, right, we went over the paper, um, his equations hold true. So there should be no fringe measured in a uniformly rotating platform, but it does. So that's where in Sagnac, um, you know, falsified relativity in 1913. That was the that was the beginning of it, right? And they've been playing catch up ever since to to hide the, to hide. This. Let me ask you this: Do the guys know that they're lying, or do they actually think that they're on to something? Like, is it all because, like, if you look at like Aries failure, they can't explain that. They, they, it simply proves the earth isn't moving, it proves that the sky is moving, but they're able. So, are they lying, or do they actually think that they've come up with something that explains it? What's your thoughts? So, they actually never came up with anything to explain even Aries failure, right? <laughs> so right. That's a problem. So, so if you're if you're if you're a heliocentrist and you believe that the earth is moving, the explanation for Aries failure for you. If you believe in wave particle duality, then the quantization of light is little tiny particles, right? So when those little tiny particles hit the water, they actually have to somehow gain acceleration to uh, maintain the speed so that the telescope doesn't have to correct, right? So that, you know, that's How a violation that of the conservation. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's is not it, even is part it of it. light going through a, a fish tank also a violation of the concept of, uh, because if you shoot a light through a fish tank, it'll hit the water, slows down. Then when it comes out of the fish tank, it does re speed up again, supposedly. Exactly. Well, that's why we say it's a rate of induction because right. it's it, relative to the medium, right? So it's um, yeah, but their uh, model that, in their model it's wrong. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. So in their model, what they're saying is that the that the light is actually like bouncing around the intermolecular structure of that, and it's <laughs> and then it comes. So it's just taking a longer path to travel through it, and when it comes out the other side, it's still going the same speed, which is obviously insane. <laughs> okay. So so uh, so right. anyway, uh, for the heliocentrists and wave particle lads. You have to say that the when the uh, light hits the water, it somehow goes faster. And then for the wave lads that are heliocentrist, they have to say that somehow there's some mechanism inside of the telescope that's carrying the wave in the opposite direction of motion, so that it doesn't require a a wavelength it's, or a, a correction angle change. And in in Mickelson Morley's 1887 paper, the first paragraph he opens up with with this you, explanation, like breaking this down. It. It, what's that? I said I heard you read it. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You heard that. Yeah. yeah, dude. It's epic, dog. Like they got nothing. Have you heard uh, uh, Mind Shock when he starts talking about how um, there was a former forum that was talking about geocentrism, and then he talks about how the real battle was between Einstein and um, Tesla. Have you heard him talk about that? No. I'm gonna send you I, a clip. I don't. I, I don't. Really, I've heard like secondhand stories of it, but I don't watch uh, any Mind Shock really. Thank you very much for the support there. I don't know where the alert went, but. Anyway, uh, I'll find out. And yeah, I'll find that video for you. I just want you to hear that one part because I got to talk to him and find out what exactly he's referring to. All right, anything else for us before we let you go? Nope, that's it, man. So tomorrow I'll be streaming Flat Earth Friday, so check us out there. And then, oh yeah, actually, we're, we're about to go live uh, after we wrap this up. So Shane and Toby are going to come through. 
and drop a little gravy. And then we're going to go live and do some reading out of a physics textbook to see if we can't get learned up. Nice. And then tomorrow will be Flat Earth Friday starting at 8 p.m. EST. And then Saturday, we might have a watch party for the principal. So keep an eye out if that pops up on YouTube. Very cool. We'll be streaming that and we'll have a watch party on Discord. It is mandatory viewing. If you're a flat earther, it's good. if you're a geocentrist, if you are a globe skeptic, if you have not yet watched that movie, you need to do so uh, whenever they have their watch party. How about that? There's your homework assignment. All right. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. Peace. Later. All right. We've got Shane up next. Shane St. Pierre. <laughs> How are you? Nice. What's up? What's going on, everyone? Jaron, good to see you again, man. You as well. You as well. All right. There you go. Yeah. Thought we'd do about four minutes of Shane's model since I don't think everyone knows about it yet. All right, Shane's <laughs> model, guys. Check it out. Here we go. Uh, when are you ready? Let's get it right. going. So uh, we used to have Walter Bisland's model, which I used to use religiously when we got here, but it had this problem called bendy light that we had to remove, right? So what we had to do was go through the source code, grab it, post it up, do a private hosting, redo the JavaScript so that we have a bigger personal dome. We have removed bendy light. We have, you know, redefined essentially every uh, description of the mechanism of how it works. So it's actually accessible at ADL.place. You can so just hop on. He's at ADL.place for those wondering where we're at. Okay, go ahead. And you can do the database up here, which is going to support the reasons for the model and just click on the model. And here we go. Change the picture, of course, for a new emblem. But these descriptions, what I mean, these have all been updated. They're more accurate. They describe the mechanisms by which the, the this model is is working. And essentially, all it does is take observations from uh, timeanddate.com and squish them onto this map. Uh, now, it is sort of the celestial coordinate map, just like all the other maps, right? We have <laughs> the globe map, which we can translate to any other map at will. They're all equal, guys, right? The same GPS, longitude, and latitude system is used for each. So when we arrive at something like this, it's, uh, you know, the best version of what we have available to us, right? So there we go, a nice size and equal equidistant. That's what we're using. It's just the same data uh, translated for everyone. So we chose to emulate it with that. But the other thing is this isn't just based on uh, random, you know, uh, flat earth science. This is actual observations and mathematical based celestial sphere mechanics, right? So the big one, which was 69 miles per degree, right? Was all, you can't have that because it's curvature. Oh, false, nope. Vertical spreadsheet enforced a unit circle to do some basic trig and walked that angle from 90 degrees all the way uh, from, from the North Pole to the equator and marked down what the uh, unit circle forcing the spherical radius at 3959 would do. And actually it works perfectly, go figure. We did some graphs, did some data, did some analysis. Of course, that's also where we determined that we don't see linearly. It's actually, you know, a logarithmic like scale approaching the limit of the uh, limit of your vision, but never actually reaching it. So that's the backup for that. Of course, we have the backup for the uh, the math for uh, the, the spherical limit of your visual space. Of course, if we don't see in Euclidean 3D space, then of course it has a limit, and that limit can be described by the combination of the Rayleigh criterion, your the limit of your vision being the radius of 3959, and the expected optical drop rate right of uh, eight inches per mile squared. Those can always be backwards compatible to derive any of the other two. If you have two, you can derive the other third. So that's the basis for the spherical limit of the celestial sphere. Of course, we also use and utilize the celestial sphere. That's the whole basis for the model over here is the moving personal celestial sphere. And if you're unfamiliar with that, the database tab associated with that has a nice little tool that you can just go check out how the celestial sphere actually works, right? I'm not doing anything crazy. This is exactly how everyone observes the sky. We're just gonna put it in a pattern that makes it more <laughs> agreeable to you, right? So this is essentially how it would work. You start the animation, they emulate the earth turning. This is just the stars turning and this is what everyone sees. Super easy. All right. So I just wanted to get that out there in four minutes and make sure we have everyone available. It is called Shane's model oh. so that you can confidently throw it out there and then I can take all the flat questions, you know, animosity, which will undoubtedly come with it. Yeah. <laughs> when you showed the graphs and you showed that the tail end of our site is dying off, is that would that cause things in the distance to appear lower? It could. It also specifically governs things at the limit, right? So when they say we see linearly infinitely, it's like, okay, but at the horizon, is that 69 miles per degree? If you see a star on the horizon and you move 69 miles, does it move up one degree? And the answer is no. Right. It's past this point, right? It doesn't actually follow that limit. And below this limit, it wouldn't actually follow that limit. So okay. right here is the linear portion, right? So at, at the edge of the limit, we would say that it approaches unresolvability as near as the logarithmic function would approach infinity. Okay. Right? So right 
So it doesn't actually be, it's, it's beyond 3959, but it's unresolvable. So it's within your limit, but you can't resolve it. And so between the two red lines you're talking about, that's when we can do the, you know, if I, something's twice as far away, it's half as big because it's going to work right. linearly through that zone. Exactly. So right here, if you stuck to this portion, then everything you observe linearly, the math would work out exactly. Yep. And then it would start to not work out right past here. But don't worry, they have correction tables to make sure that that never happens, right? So if you happen to use data past that point, you just correct it based on the logarithmic correction scale and everything's hunky-dory again, right? Right here. Beautiful. So it's all good. Shane's model, everybody, and you can find it at adl.place, uh, amongst so many other things there. So uh, have fun right. tonight. You guys are going to do a little reading. We are. We do a little reading every Thursday. We like to be educated, as they say. All right. Do some, <laughs> do some actual PDFs. Yep. Sounds good. Thanks so much, buddy. Thanks for having us, man. Talk to you later. Later. Up next, we've got, uh, well, I thought it was going to be Nicole. <laughs>